Part 3. Mortal Belongings If you've ever felt bathed in moonlight, caressed by the sun, enveloped in silence, awash with the sheer vibrancy in the air, felt fate brushing up against your lips, if, if you've ever stood on the edge of a cliff and let the wind enfold you, let the rain blanket your physique, if, if you've ever been tickled by somebody taking a pratfall, you will know that our nakedness is being touched all the time. From the moment we're conceived, nature has its grubby, gorgeous hands all over us. Nature is nothing if not not a voyeur, a voyeur of itself. Its sounds, sights, smells, tastes and touchy-feelies will not let us out of its grip, not even for one moment. It's being alive. We may like to think we can create our own space in, in our imagination, but the best we can do is edit, adapt, modify, redirect or, or try to censor what we prefer to allow in. As if nature were a tap we could turn on or off at will, forgetting that our own skin is as elemental as anything on earth, and the air we breathe is fundamentally the same inside, outside, upside down. And is it a trap? Is it an ambush? Or simply a womb, a web, a world we've been gifted, and can never avoid or escape until we become something else altogether, no longer being human? in which case other non-elemental fundamentals will apply. But for now, without nature's touch, we would be vacancies in space, because as we know, nature abhors a vacuum. So as long as we're mortal, that's not an option. Our only option is learning to live with it and leaving it when it chooses to let us go. Lessons are offered freely 24-7, day or night. We're all in the same school, same class. It seems to be only natural we occasionally resent our teacher, whose only stake is to be allowed to teach. Should we refuse to listen and try to turn a blind eye, mumble disconcertions irresponsibly, or stuff our noses up with the smell of our own self-disgust that, that we are not teachers of ourselves ourselves? Are we doomed to never graduate with any honours at all? Should some perverted pride prefer us to numb ourselves to its tenderest overtures, decide to take from nature's school only enough to be rid of its fearful, death-defining tyranny, which ironically is what the fear of death is, a desperate desire to not be free of this life, which came first, the chicken or the egg, the mystery or the need to know what we don't know. Where did that need come from? What was not originally being satisfied? What isn't being satisfied now? And is it the same thing? To be more than our nature naturally allows. To be master of the teacher. The summer of 1969. The whole world was focused on the moon. According to this guy on public radio. I wasn't. I didn't give a fuck about the moon. If it suddenly dropped out of the sky, I might sit up and take notice. Otherwise, I had far more important things to take care of. I can't remember exactly what, but I know it wasn't the moon. It's a grown planet. It can take care of itself. But this guy on the radio is insisting we have to somehow rekindle that sense of excitement about space exploration. Otherwise, he could be out of a job. But apart from that, it is absolutely essential if we're to know the origin of the universe. Talk about a donkey chasing its own tail on top of an anthill, crushing a lot of ants in the process. Well, that moment, they were, don't give a mule's ass where the donkey came from, just how they're going to fucking escape this bedeviled genocidal burrito. But no, 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 we absolutely need to know how the universe was formed. Believing in some great mystery just doesn't cut the scientific mustard. We, we'd be no better than silly asses, no curiosity whatsoever about what's swatting all the flies off behind our back. Let's face it, if it wasn't for Albert Einstein, we might never have known our relatives. If it wasn't for Attila the Hun, we might never have known the full potential of firm leadership. No Henry Ford, who we might still be trudging through the mud to pick up our driver's license. Wouldn't even need a driver's license. Nobody would ever know for sure what they were entitled to. We'd be lucky if we could assemble a party of six to figure out the right time to plant broccoli. It would take us ten years to experience the Grand Canyon. 
and emergency services would have to be severely downsized. There'd be no need for I-95 to seem to run on forever to keep us in touch with the universe. The universe, which is flat. The same guy on the radio. The universe is flat. The earth is round, but the universe is flat. He can prove it. He's seen the satellite photographs, no curvature at all. The earth is round, but the universe is flat. What does that tell us about the World Cup and the Winter Olympics? How to squeeze a soccer ball into a Cabri wafer? I was, I was surprised that nobody mentioned me dad's musical ability at his funeral. Because he played drums in a band in the Navy. It was never confirmed in Churchill's memoirs, but I know for a fact he was very good with a fork and a spoon at the dinner table. And I have a vivid memory of him playing his accordion. He definitely had rhythm, never muddied it up with the blues, melody and swing. That was his thing, Bing Crosby, Glenn Miller. He wasn't a rock and roller, but he, but he had a strong, pleasant singing voice. I remember him singing once at a family gathering, but nobody seemed to want to stop and listen. I think they thought he took himself a little too seriously. He could never compete with me Uncle Alan's drunken parodies of Al Jolson. So I decided to let that one go. I didn't even hear him singing around the house. He decided to leave it to the professionals and to ask Steve, because you couldn't stop me singing if you paid me, which, of course, nobody ever did to sing or not to sing, but I'd build a repertoire to buoy him, buoy me up for a lifetime, keep the darkness at bay. I, I secretly considered singing a Bing Crosby medley at his funeral, but I didn't think anybody would want to stop and listen. Just wants to show us what a strong, pleasant singing voice he has. So I decided not to make an exhibition of myself. Now, that was me mum's deepest credo. You don't want to make an exhibition of yourself. I think her own highest aspiration was to be inconspicuously present. Nobody likes to show off. Unless you've really got something to show off, in which case you'd be on telly by now and beam to her from a safe, unembarrassing distance. We have to know our place in this world, somewhere on the outskirts of its periphery, out of sight, out of mind. You, you don't want everybody looking at you. Why is it? Why is everybody looking at me? Why is everybody... I'm sitting at my dad's bedside in Ward B2, and suddenly he's convinced that everybody's looking at him. Why is, why is everybody looking at me? I just want to see a man reduced to rubble. Bill Bell would finally get his comeuppance. And I'm looking around. Nobody's looking at him. Everybody's looking at me. And he's too helpless to put up a good show. Oh, the agony of the inexpressible, the indescribable, the utterly domitable. And now my dad's dead. Maybe they'll always be in England, but my dad's dead. And that's the fact. I kissed his corpse goodbye on the morning of his funeral in the chapel of rest next door to the fish and chip shop. I planted a, a sweet memorial on his refrigerated forehead. He didn't look much like himself anymore, more like some miniature ghoulish mannequin discount from an old Hammer horror movie. The blood-shocked eye sockets and the preternaturally sealed lips. No hands and feet. His hands and feet had been macabrely folded into the drapes of the coffin. Maybe they'd lost his shoes. Maybe he had holes in his socks. I know for a fact somebody had mislaid his wedding ring at the hospital. But this did not seem the time to make a fuss. His spirit had departed, hopefully passed on to a bit of place. Maybe the fish and ship shop next door. Who knows what awaits us in the next world? Mushy peas and meat pie and six pair of the chips and no gravy. Of course, there's nothing worse than gravy mixed with your mushy peas. I'd left me mum back at the house, watching cartoons on television. Rupert the Bear. Rupert, Rupert wasn't sure he was ready to face up to the monster just yet. Those were the first words I heard when I, I came downstairs on my way to the chapel of rest. Rupert wasn't sure he was ready to face up to the monster just yet. Apparently, Rupert had built himself a treehouse for a more spectacular view of the world, but, but a sudden gust of wind blew it away and he landed on top of this one-eyed cyclops, and Rupert spent half the night terrified till he realised it was a lighthouse. His great adventure had turned into a shipping hazard. Life could come crashing on the rocks at any moment. Of course, eventually, with a little help from his friends, Rupert was brought back down to earth. He returned home and, and he realised the view from his backyard was just as miraculous as anything he'd see from up in the air. And a rainbow appeared to confirm his epiphany. The world was at peace. 
released till his next great adventure. Same time tomorrow, same channel. Do you like looking at dead bodies? Asked me mum later when I got back to the house. I didn't know he was that poorly. I never thought I'd be the last one to go. Where, where are you going, mum? Oh, don't ask me. I'm buggered if I know. It's a mystery to me. Me and Albert Einstein. Let's face it. Someone's facts will always be dependent on somebody else's fancies. One man's tragedy is another man's cartoon and vice versa. One, one woman's soap opera, another woman's reality check. One man's revolution, another man's just more of the bloody same. And most people don't like chains. They don't like change unless they initiate it, including myself. And I'd like everything to stay exactly as it is till I decide to change it. I want to be in God's fully informed vanguard and let the devil take the hindmost by surprise.